So hi, hi everyone. Uh, we're going to start now and uh, just going to try and make sure that we can cover up maybe the couple of minutes that we've uh, lost uh, uh, for getting into panel two. But this is going to be uh, the other side of one of the scalability questions that exists with India's Data Protection Act. Um, the fact that we've introduced a requirement for verifiable consent uh, un uh, under the Data Protection Act. And on this panel, we're going to be joined um, by a, a fairly diverse set of uh, people. We've got Kirian Donovan, who's the founder of a firm uh, called KID, uh, aptly named, that helps provide developers with a safe way to authenticate uh, and protect children online. And this connects directly to what our act requires, because it requires all data fiduciaries before they process personal data of children to actually collect verifiable consent from the parents uh, of those children. And we think that like that plays perfectly well into Kirin's strength and what his firm looks to solve. Um, we also have Iksan. Uh, Iksan is a partner at a uh, law firm in Indonesia called Asegaf Hamza and Partners. Iksan, do correct me if that pronunciation uh, uh, is a bit off. Um, uh, we'd love to hear from Iksan because we think that Indonesia is the other country, especially in an Asian market, that has a similar requirement. And so the parallels between the conversations between India and Indonesia will be really interesting to get into. Uh, fine, uh, we, we also have um, Vrinda. Vrinda is an advocate at the Supreme Court of India who's worked extensively on digital rights in India uh, and has uh, worked extensively not only on the... Um, Data Protection Act, but also on the government digital identity system, Aadhaar. So it would be great to hear from her on uh, what are the kinds of things that we need to think about from a ch child uh, privacy perspective. And finally, we have Bailey. Uh, Bailey Sanchez is a senior counsel with the Future of Privacy Forum's youth and education team. Uh, she leads uh, FPF's work uh, analyzing proposals in the U.S. that impact children's um, and uh, teens' online privacy and safety. Uh, Bailey, please do uh, expand on your profile uh, as required for us to get to uh, contextualize your overall work stream at FPF a bit better. But we would love to hear from you on how the FTC looks at this issue because we know that the FTC has been running a requirement for um, parental consent for children's data uh, under the uh, Child's Online Privacy Protection Act in the U.S. for some time now. This panel will be co-moderated by me and Christina. Uh, Christina is a, um, a policy counsel for global privacy at the Future of Privacy Forum uh, and uh, I also we also have joining us uh, Mr. Mahesh, uh, Mr. Rakesh Maheshwari, who we're just trying to figure out um, uh, how he's going to join in. But the moment he does, uh, we'd love to uh, hear from his comments as well. Uh, he is the former senior director and group coordinator for the Data Governance Division uh, at the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. That's the Indian ministry that has been responsible for uh, and is uh, for the drafting of the Data Protection Act and is now looking at its implementation. Uh, great. So with that, um, I think what I'm going to do is that instead of getting into a detailed presentation, I'm just going to provide the quick overview. The law requires that you have uh, before you uh, as a data fiduciary before you process personal data of any uh, child or of any person with a disability who has a lawful guardian, you have to collect parent uh, verifiable consent from that parent or lawful guardian. Uh, and the definition of a child is capped in the law itself as any person that has not completed the age of 18. What's interesting is that there is scope for the central government to provide exemptions for either certain classes of data fiduciaries, uh, the India's equivalent of the global concept of data controllers, or for certain purposes uh, of processing, uh, and, and, and also allows for the central government to lower the age if you are able to prove that you can carry out the processing of personal data of children in a verifiably safe manner. This is over and above, of, co of course, the other various ways in which you can get exemptions from consent requirements into the Act, but these are the two main ones. Um, and with that, I'm going to jump directly to um, Iksan first, because we'd love to hear from you about how and, and, and why this requirement has been uh, provided under the Indonesian law and provide perhaps you could help us understand what was the problem that the Indonesian government was trying to solve and what are the types of difficulties that, uh, you know, perhaps you've seen play out in the Indonesian context that may be relevant for us to think about here in India. Over to you, Iksan. Yep. Uh, thank you, Varun. Um, please confirm if, if, if I'm audible. Uh, my voice is... Um, you can hear my voice. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. 
Um, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be speaking in this event. Um, uh, so, so I'll just briefly, you know, uh, share the the rationale behind uh, similar requirements have been uh, issued in Indonesia. Um, so, pretty much similar to uh, in any other countries, um, the the internet has brought positive and definitely negative impacts. Uh, more so in Indonesia, uh, based on a recent uh, report uh, in 2023, uh, it's been it's, uh, it's been confirmed. Uh, there are around uh, you know 60 percent of the population have been using social media, and um, majority of that population are underage. Are underage um, uh, individuals or, um, or kids, um, even uh, children under the age of thirteen, um, and we've seen so many cases in Indonesia uh, where the use of social media and, and the internet um, have brought serious uh, impact to uh, the, the children. Um, based on that, uh, um, most cases that have been seen, uh, which are very uh, concerning, uh, the government has uh, wanted to regulate uh, children uh, children rights um, more seriously and this was elevated uh, and, and and also um, incorporated in the Indonesian personal data protection law which was issued uh, not long ago uh, in 2022 um, the requirement uh, is that whenever a data controller or a data fiduciary wishes to uh, process personal data of a children or a people with disabilities uh, they will need uh, to have explicit uh, to have... consent of the parents or the legal guardian. Uh, the law does not require that it has to be verified, uh, but in the upcoming implementing regulation, uh, as can be seen from a draft regulations which was released by uh, the government not long ago, it appears that it will be uh, a very uh, verifiable parental consent that will be uh, the requirement. Uh, now. The Indonesian government has not um, uh, incorporated the Personal Data Protection Commission. As such, uh, there's not yet any guidelines on what will be, uh, on what will uh, be the definition uh, or, or the form of a acceptable, verifiable parental consent. However, uh, children protection issue um, has been uh, quite concerning in the past. And uh, there has been a child protection commission in Indonesia uh, for quite some time. And uh, in practice, what, what, what businesses uh, can do while waiting for uh, the present data protection commission to be incorporated and issue um, specific guidelines is to rely on guidelines that have been issued by the child protection commission. The child protection commission in Indonesia uh, yeah. has adopted uh, the ITU uh, Children uh, Online Protection uh, Guidelines, uh, which was issued not uh, around in uh, 2020. Uh, although the guideline is a soft law and uh, is not um, mandatory, uh, this was uh, the approach that the Children Protection Commission in Asia has been um, suggesting or recommending, uh, recommending the industry players, uh, particularly online service providers uh, to adopt when developing you know, serv online services, uh, whether or not these online services will be used by uh, uh, children or not. Um, so perhaps I'll stop there, uh, Varun. Uh, hopefully that gives a, a brief overview of the landscape uh, in Indonesia um, you know, as a start for this discussion. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you, Iksan. And I'd just like to jump directly to Mr. Maheshwari, if you could please turn on his video. So I think we heard from Iksan about the fact that there are certain, uh, you know, common problems that perhaps all perhaps all governments are interested in trying to figure out. You know, they're looking at this from a child safety perspective. Mr. Maheshwari, you've obviously worked on India's data protection bill for uh, over a decade now. Um, in your experience, especially, you know, from the days of the Sri Krishna Committee onwards, we because we've seen a requirement for uh, you know ch um, parental consent since ever since then what was the problem that the indian government has been trying to solve and i think what would be particularly interesting to understand from you sir is that unlike the indonesian requirement we explicitly state in the act that this has to be verifiable consent and maybe you could help us 
understand what those two requirements mean and what is the kind of challenges that you know the Indian government is trying to fix with this requirement under the Data Protection Act. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Varun, and thank you, NASCOM, for uh, giving, I mean, uh, permitting me to share my views. See, from uh, Data Protection Act perspective, right from the beginning, I mean, the day the Shri Krishna Committee was made, the the later on the bill was introduced in the parliament, there were uh, concerns about child safety, particularly, uh, I mean, various kind of online harms that they are susceptible to. And for that reason, the intent of the government bringing in some sort of a verification mechanism for the children and particularly because children of their own cannot give a consent therefore bringing in the parents or the guardians legal guardians for that reason was in the intent right from beginning the only difference which has come or or the the uh, modus operandi is different which this time is clearly communicating that it has to be a verifiable mechanism along with the parent. And that what probably puts the challenges also, puts opportunity, gives opportunity also for India to be able to take lead as to how this can be done. Of course, when the law was written, in any case, it was understood that maybe for different types of platforms, different mechanisms will be there and hopefully government will also have to pitch in particularly uh, the model of uh, digital locker or any other situation at the government level and through some tokenization mechanism and through API maybe the same information is passed on to the concerned platform to be able to do the verification. So that was the broad aim. And as I said, any any law for that reason brings in opportunities as well. I'm sure over a period of time, certain technological solutions will also emerge and that was the aim. Thank you, thank you for that. And I think uh, where I'd like to right now, uh, what I like to move to is that now that we've heard something came around how governments are looking at the problem, uh, and we've also heard from Mr. Maheshwari that the uh, government is also seeing this uh, um, as one way in which you know the government can also be involved as part of the solution as well. Uh, I'd love to hand, hand over uh, to Christina to uh, take for, uh, take us forward to the next set of questions. Over to you, Christina. Thank you very much, Varun. Uh, so, Kiran, I would like to ask you, uh, given your experience with actually trying to meet aid skating requirements in practice, can you help us understand what are the different types of methods available to collect verifiable parental consent? So, what are the challenges also that you, you have seen businesses face with respect to choosing a particular method? And also, on top of that, what do they need from regulators to implement a particular method effectively? Because I think this is the most important uh, element to look at. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's great to be here on the, on the panel. Um, I mean, if you look at this from a global perspective, uh, there's 103 countries at this stage that require parental consent. Um, of those, only four tell you how to get it. So in the vast bulk of cases, it's very much left to the service to determine how to do it. Of those other 99, there's just over 50 that have guidance um, that gives you at least some indication of methods that might be uh, appropriate. And when you look at those different types of methods, they extend from everything that you know is very basic, uh, an email verification through to using a third-party verification service. So you have an intermediary, which is in, intended to be very privacy-preserving, um, payment transactions with or without some sort of record, with or without some form of payment, um, using mobile phones, having SMS two-factor with codes. Uh, you can have um, signed forms, of course, and, and electronic signed forms. Uh, we've seen you know, question-based approaches where you try and determine the maturity of uh, 
um, the user and in, in, it's intended to target the parent by giving something that really only an adult would be able to, to answer. Um, and you go so on and so forth through to the emerging methods that are really around either digital identity um, or age estimation. And there's, there's a whole variety of technologies um, around that. The biggest barrier um, from a commercial perspective in doing any of this is cost. And if you look at the prices today, it's all cost per transaction. Um, if you look at the, the the market forum, and those costs can range anywhere from sort of two to five cents for a facial age estimation check, um, right through to a dollar or two dollars for various ID checks. If your revenue per user, if your ARPU is less than that you're not going to, as a service, decide that it's a great idea. It's not a great commercial decision to implement verification, right? Because your cost of acquiring the user, your revenue per user is less than the cost of verifying the parent. So you have to have something that is cheaper than your ARPU. That's, that's sort of the basic premise that most businesses will start with. The alternative, if it's more expensive than that, even if you decide that from a compliance perspective, no, we're going to go the extra mile and we're going to do this. You're now faced with a, a decision about well, what type of verification method are we are we going to implement? The more expensive you get, typically you get a more robust verification um, in terms of the, the, the order trail and being able to trace the identity of the user. But the risk you're taking is that you're adding friction to the experience. And based on our research, um, for those markets where they've introduced uh, relatively um, sophisticated verification methods, and by that I mean we're dealing with you know digital identi identification checks, we're dealing with you know driver's license passports, those sorts of things, um, which are generally a high degree of confidence in, in the verification. Um, in our research, up to 70% of parents will actually help their kids circumvent that verification method because it's too painful for the parent to go through it. And so if you add too many steps, most parents at that point will say, oh, can you just change your date of birth, right? How, just, just enter my date of birth, right? Get, get around it because, you know, parents are busy. They, they'll get asked a lot by their kids, you know, hey, get me into this, get me into this, get me into this. Um, we're all fami familiar if we have kids with pop-ups coming all the time from various services asking for access to games and all sorts of things. And so from a, from a pure sort of psychology perspective, when you're dealing with a parent, um, it needs to be something that a parent is also willing to do and is, is um, less friction um, and makes meaningful sense for the, for the parent to, to do it. And so I think, and we, we can get to this a little bit later around verifiably safe, I think the, the golden case would be something that's less than your cost of APU, that's something that parents are going to help their kids try and circumvent. Um, and that's something that is going to be meaningful in terms of the actual service that you're accessing. So it's it's very context dependent. Thank you. Thank you so much for highlighting the different like methods for collecting verifiable consent. And indeed, I think it's very important to keep in mind that the challenges that we are looking at do have a global element. So they are not just unique to a specific jurisdiction. And also very interesting, of course, to hear the biggest barriers, both from a commercial and compliance perspective. Uh, so I'm going to pass it over to Varun once again for the next question. So thanks, thanks, Christina. And I think uh, this is actually a question I'd love to ask to both you, Christina, as somebody uh, uh, sitting in the EU, and to you, Bailey, as somebody that's you know sitting in the US, and perhaps we could start with you, Bailey, as well. That, so uh, as India looks to implement its requirement, we've we've seen the context, we've seen Kirin talk about the challenges from a business perspective, helping us contextualize, you know, uh, a, a big problem and a legal requirement down to, you know, the calculus at a business level. But what's the actual regulatory and enforcement or, uh, you know, uh, experience been? And, and this is why the FTC experience in the US is so important. And can you help us understand what is the exact FTC regime look like uh, and uh, could you help us provide an example of the kinds of practical challenges that have been posed, uh, if any, with the FTC experience or any lessons that, you know, we can get uh, with the FTC experience uh, to India and uh, do also help us understand how the FTC looks at different methods uh, of, uh, you know, uh, consent collection from parents and age gating in general. Over to you, Bailey. Sure. Thank you for that question. Um, so a little bit about my background at FPF. Um, I actually spent about two years 
working on a project like um, doing a deep dive on this specific issue on VPC under COPPA and different friction points. Um, so a lot of the methods that are used in the U.S. are the ones that were just described by here. And FPF actually has an infographic on these methods and friction points uh, that you can view at the stateofplay.org. So just wanted to make sure I gave that little plug before I forgot. Um, so under COPPA, COPPA um, applies to children under 13. So I think that's the biggest difference between um, India and the U.S. Uh, so it applies to services directed at children. So like child-friendly services or ones that are actually uh, like services that have actual knowledge that um, children are on the website. Um, so um, another important piece of the FTC regime is that COPPA can be enforced by the FTC or state attorney generals. And then COPPA does also allow for safe harbor programs. Um, so safe harbors are like industry self-regulation groups that guarantee that um, the safe harbor companies that join that service uh, are meeting either the same or greater protections for children as the standards in the COPPA rule. Um, so COPPA safe harbors can bring their own investigations against companies. They can also approve their own verifiable parental consent methods, even if they are not ones that are specifically approved by the FTC. Um, so a core requirement of COPPA is that covered services are required to obtain VPC before collecting personal information. Um, so there's no specific mandate within the statute itself, um, and you don't have to follow any particular method, but within the like COPPA rule that like the FTC puts forward, there are a lot of like existing approved methods, and a lot of them are the ones that Kieran just detailed, like phone call, uh, credit or debit card, government ID. Um, interestingly, mobile telephone is not currently a method under COPPA. The FTC has actually specifically said they don't believe that to be sufficient, um, but it looks like that is actually going to be changing. They're in the process of updating their new rule. Um, so there are no specific methods that you have to follow, um, but the I, I guess the gold standard that you need to comply with is that an operator must choose a method that is reasonably designed in light of available technology to ensure that the person giving the consent is the child's parent. Um, so something I did want to note is that none of the methods really are looking too closely at whether or not it is the parent of the child, um, just because the, the current technology does not really lend itself to like going down that road of figuring out, okay, is this a parent? Is this a legal guardian? Um, the way that the FTC approaches this is just that like if like the person that is going through the steps of, you know, providing their credit card, providing their government ID, doing like a phone call, um, they are likely to be the parent or guardian Um based on the technology. Um, so two practical challenges I wanted to highlight are just that like, you know, COPPA was passed in 1998. The internet looks very different uh, today than it did in 1998. So in, as children are increasingly online, there's a scalability issue because, you know, a parent is going to have to go through this verifiable parental consent process for each service that their child uses. So, you know, maybe in 1998, that might've been one website and today it might be uh, 10 or 20. Um, so, uh, throughout the course of time, uh, solutions providers have started to pop up to kind of like make this more scalable, like it, like similar to like a consent management platform. Um, and then another challenge is that no method is a hundred percent perfect. You know, the, the technology I just described is not really like cutting edge technology for the most part. There are like, uh, pitfalls to each method. So a good practice is often to offer multiple methods, but as Kieran just described, it's quite costly to do that. Um, and again, I think that's where like consent management platforms try to like play a role here. Um, so I, I will stop there uh, and give it back to you. Thanks. And Christina, just just because we got so much context on the, F the US approach, uh, could you help us just understand what's the state of play in the European Union around all of this? Yes, of course. Uh, thank you, Varun. So uh, before delving into consent and par parental consent, I should primarily note that under the GDPR, the controller has to establish a specific legal base basis in order to process personal data. For instance, it can use the basis of a contract, of legitimate interest, or of consent, of course. So if the controller uses the legal basis of consent, the article that is very relevant to our discussion is Article 8 of the GDPR. Uh, 
And according to this uh, specific article, a controller that is offering information society services directly to a child can get child consent for processing personal data if the child is above 16 years old. However, here we should note that member states can lower this age to 13. For example, if I'm not mistaken, in Spain, a child from the age of 14 can actually consent to the processing of his or her personal data. So what does this mean in practice? It means that the controller has to somehow verify that the child's age is what the child's child's age is in order to actually ask for valid consent. Uh, so according to the EDPB, the European Data Protection Body that oversees all data protection authorities in the EU, age verification should not lead to excessive data processing. Of course, this is a very deli delicate issue, we could say, because the controller has to strike the right balance between Restrict respecting the data minimization principle and ensuring that parental consent was granted in all instances that was required. And here one, of course, could ask, why then should the controller choose consent? Because as I told you, we have other legal bases as well. Uh, why not choose another legal basis as an alternative? And here, I think it's very important to briefly mention a very recent case from the Italian Data Protection Authority on a chatbot application that was intended to reach minors. So here, the Italian DPA ruled that the controller had not implemented an adequate, adequate age verification mechanism. So far, so good. But the point that I want to highlight here is that the Italian authority ruled out the legal ground of contractual necessity. So the authority explained that children are not actually capable to, to enter contracts under Italian law, especially when such contracts imply making available extensive personal data. So this meant that the controller had to get parental consent and for that to happen, a robust age verification mechanism was of course necessary. So we see how linked is the concept of parental consent with AIDS verification. And this is like a very brief overview of where we are right now in the EU. Of course, I could say more about AIDS verification mechanisms, but what I would like to say to close my, my brief overview is that we did have very recent, recent decisions from data protection authorities and very high profile ones uh, that highlighted all the uncertainties revolving around this issue and the unclear landscape in terms of the state of the art technology of age verification mechanisms. Um, so that is that uh, with the EU and I can pass it on to you again, Varun. I think that is that doesn't do justice to uh, how big the question has become for us. But um, just wanted to pick up from both uh, what you and Bailey mentioned, and we would love to then come to Vrinda. And Vrinda, unfortunately, I'm going to come at you with a two-parter question because of this. So the first thing is that picking up from what Bailey said on safe harbors, and uh, for our Indian uh, attendees right now, this is not the Section 79 safe harbor. It's closer, actually, to the concept of verifiably safe processing as an exception under Section 93. So that's where, you know, like the term safe harbor can uh, often become quite loaded. So it's not the same one. Uh, but Brinda, to you, the first question actually I would want to ask is that based on your experience um, with the law and uh, about speaking to entities looking to comply with it, what kind of entities are actually meriting the exemptions that are contemplated underneath the Act from this requirement for verifiable parental, uh, verifiable consent? And um, the second part actually picks up from what just Christina was telling us, right, that DPAs are actually in Europe now thinking about um, moving in, in perhaps the same sort of thinking, but maybe less rigid than our approach has been, that you know, you do want to make sure that consent becomes the more valuable base of processing. And perhaps we've jumped ahead in that sense. But uh, given the fact that you're, uh, you, you, in India, we would also look at the government being involved in, in terms of offering solutions and methods that can be used for age uh, verification. What are your thoughts on, you know, how the two legal frameworks or, or the two regulatory regimes may interact between 
our government digital identity system and the data protection acts uh you know verifiable consent piece as well so uh love to hear from you brinda and please feel free to take whichever one you want to take first yeah uh thanks a lot uh so on the first question on sort of what kind of entities will merit exception uh, exemptions so just to clarify under the indian regime uh the government can note you know exempt a class of data fiduciaries or the purposes for processing and say for such classes of data fiduciaries or for such purposes you don't need a, you know verifiable parental consent so there is a lot of scope in terms of what the rules will come and what, what you know the notifications that will come i think for me the absolute sort of most immediate class or purpose in some senses that should be exempted and we saw this in earlier drafts as well, including from just, you know the sort of shri krishna draft is when you talk about mental counts you know uh, counseling mental health counseling or any sort of counseling services because currently uh, these are services where you would imagine that a child may not feel comfortable you know telling their parent about the fact that they're entering counseling there is you know we know a mental health epidemic you know depending on your sexual identity your gender identity and how you feel there are various issues where you would not feel comfortable informing your parents um and so i think in those cases you know those are absolutely purposes which should be exempt uh, where we're talking uh, about you know mental health or counseling or any sort of child friendly services you know any trauma services that are offered uh, to children as well i think there should be um, an exemption uh, so that's sort of the easier uh, i think to some extent like what kind of entities will merit exemptions i also think another thing the government can think about because what we've seen from both the us and the eu perspective is there is a certain amount of the, the fact that the verification is only happening for child directed services it isn't really happening for everybody on the internet now the law in india in some senses is very clear it has to apply to everybody so i think through the rules um, if the government does believe you know if you're only if you're a small data fiduciary if you're not processing a lot of data or you know if your business is i mean if you're a newspaper you don't necessarily need to then verify consent because under the indian current standard there are three things that you need to verify you need to ascertain the age of users to know if they're a child or not and this in some senses would apply to everybody because this is not only for child directed services you would need to verify the parent child relationship which as we've seen from what bailey was saying isn't really happening in some practical level and the third is then you have to verify parental consent the indian element adds another sort of important context which is that you're also doing this for persons with disabilities which i think is something nobody really talks about because you know we're talking about sort of children but actually the number of you know persons who would get classified as persons with disabilities is very large and we need to think separately about that that age verification process because unfortunately the law doesn't talk about what kind of disability so it's not whether it's visual whether it's intellectual whether it's physical all sorts of disabilities get covered and i think you know we that debate in some senses is already had that you know we didn't need such a wide exemption and i think i mean we didn't need such a wide requirement and i think it's sad that we have this but i think we then need to make it very very easy uh to make sure that the autonomy of persons with disability is also protected so that's broadly on the first um aspect and just a bit on the second question on consent sort of being a valuable basis and how and i think one thing we have seen in the indian regime is we kind of take a bit from the us and a bit from uh europe and try and reach this uh middle path or you know as rahul calls the third way um i think what we need to see is you have to have some sort of age and gradation uh you know risk based assessment so in some cases it can be a simple self based assessment when you're talking about giving government ids or using digi lockers or aadhar based you know social you know biometric based verification i think you have to be very very careful because there is a you know huge risk of security concerns the fact that this is extremely sensitive data that is being uploaded who's going to have access to that and you also have to also you know we're talking about uh, using sort of ai you know that's what some people are also suggesting we have to realize that the digital literacy in india is very very low and in many many cases the vast majority of people or children who are going online will be mobile first generations they've not used laptops their parents will not be digitally literate so i think in india we have to have this added practical problem of how are you actually going to implement uh, some of these sort of high tech based uh, solutions uh, you know whether it's using digi locker platforms or uploading you know kyc the one thing we have seen in india that has worked fairly well is actually mobile based ott systems um so i think that's something we could consider i think tokenization is a great idea but again i think very difficult to implement in the indian context we've seen this even with aadhaar to improve privacy the government did come out with this you know virtual id and tokenization and almost nobody has ever used it 
Uh, you know, the providers don't know how to use it. It's very, very expensive to implement. The users don't even know this exists. So I think, especially in an Indian perspective, we have to realize the digital literacy challenges that do exist. Um, so I think maybe that's it for right now. Uh, and then happy to discuss this further. Great. Uh, no, thanks, Rinda. And I think uh, great, like connecting all the dots so far that we've seen on the conversation. I, I do have one very important question that I want to pose to the panel in general. But I'd love to first hear from Iksan, uh, Kirian, and Bailey on this question, um, because there's at least some regulatory experience from abroad that we'd want to explore. And that question is, uh, in your uh, jurisdictions, what are regulators considering as satisfactory compliance? So I think the challenge in India is that, as, as Rinda pointed out, right, like we've got so many things to establish. Um, how do we, how, how, how can, what are, what are regulators providing to businesses to show that, you know, you've discharged that requirement? And uh, Iksan, maybe in your case, it would be about demonstrating consent itself, but maybe not verifiability. But for Bailey and, and Kirian, if there's anything that you could help us also understand what regulators accept as verifiability as well, and as, you know what businesses can do to meet that additional standard. So I'd love to hear from Iksan first, and then uh, uh, maybe next Kirian, and then Bailey, and then Mr. Maheshwari, please do also feel free to come in right after that. So over to you, Iksan, on this question. Thank you, Farrell. Um, so unfortunately, in Indonesia, uh, you know, the data protection law, which introduces the various uh, lawful basis or legal basis is, is very, uh, is very new. Uh, it was only uh, introduced in 2022 and there's not yet a, uh, the data protection authority that gives, you know, uh, clear guidelines on how to use these new uh, lawful basis. Prior to the personal data protection law, Indonesia is essentially, a, you know, a consent centric country uh, where all data processing uh, can only be done uh, once there is a consent uh, obtained. Uh, so, in, in terms of in, in the Indonesian experience, uh, how one can, how a data controller can can show that they have, you know, the appropriate lawful basis or the appropriate consent is typically by way of showing that there is an active consent uh, uh, being obtained from the data subjects, and and uh, active consent uh, typically takes in the form of a you know, a signature, a sign, uh, whether it's electronic or um, 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 hard copy. Uh, it can also be in the form of a, you know, tick box, uh, a tick box uh, you know, of a pop-up uh, notification. Uh, so those type of typical, uh, uh, you know, active confirmation is what is considered acceptable in Indonesia. Uh, so, so not yet uh, progressive, if you will, uh, Varun. No, uh, thanks, thanks, Iksan. I think... What I'm hearing from you is that India and Indonesia are both in still in early days. Um, with that, Kirin, I'd love to hear from you both generally on parental consent, but also specifically this challenge of verifiability. What can you help us understand from you know the practical business perspective uh, on what verifiability could look like, and you know how what would satisfy a regulator actually? Yeah, totally. I'll steer clear of the U.S. because I'm sure <laughs> you will have thoughts on that one. Um, I mean, in the vast bulk of cases, you don't have um, clear direction on what qualifies as ensuring that that's that's verified. There are some interesting, interesting. Oh, there um there are some interesting proposals um, that typically rely on uh, an intermediary, a trusted third party intermediary, and that third party is the one that uh, knows effectively that you dealing with a particular individual and therefore you can um they can validate the fact that there's a nexus between the the child and the the parent the biggest challenge with any of those is that it just is it's very impractical um like simple simple commercial questions around like okay i've had 100,000 users sign up this month um 40,000 appear to be children and therefore i relied on this you know third party intermediary to go through that process um, but I've just received a bill and it's for 60,000, right? And now you have to go through that. So you end up with, you know, you commingle the data in any event. So I think there are some real practical challenges to, to use of a third-party intermediary. I mean, I think there are some very interesting proposals around the use of the government digital IDs that are coming in in various parts of the world uh, and relying on that because you are able to identify um, effectively that 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 is the the individual that you're talking to. Ultimately, privacy preserving plus a high degree of um, trust 
that that individual is the person who, who you're dealing with is a very challenging thing to do to, to manage um, because it's almost counterintuitive. You're dealing with two different things. And so I think that's where um, ultimately tokenization, but also the ability to passport authentication across services is incredibly appealing. Um, because if, say, for example, you are going through, so say kids are going through um, by virtue of schooling, parents get involved, they're signing lots of forms, they're providing passports. Um, and so you have a very high degree of confidence in terms of the nexus between a child and a parent when it comes to those school systems. Being able to passport that authenticated result to other services, you don't need the data. What you want to know is that, that there is a trusted nexus between the parent and the child, I think is an extremely interesting area that um, is real, really fertile ground to explore. Uh, so in the U.S., um, it, just given the way that COPPA is structured, it is harder to like proactively or actively prove compliance, whereas you're more often trying to like make sure you don't get the attention of the FTC. I think the exception here is with the COPPA safe harbors, because uh, with the COPPA safe harbors, you're kind of like you, you're applying to them, you're like doing a certification process. So there you would like actively be proving that you are in compliance with the law, whereas like with the FTC, you're trying, it's uh, kind of a negative. So um, when the FTC has brought enforcement actions against services who are violating this part of COPPA, it's not often that they're taking issue with the specific verifiable per, uh, parental consent mechanism. It's that oftentimes it's been companies that are just not doing this provision at all. Um, so it'll be companies that maybe don't realize that they need to comply with COPPA or realize that this is uh, an important piece of the puzzle. Um, another thing that comes up is kind of like the step zero before verifiable parental consent. It's the um, the neutral age screen. So Christina talked about um, age verification a bit. So age verification and verifiable parental consent, they, they often go hand in hand and they're often um, the same uh, methods, but they are like two different steps in the process. Um, so something that's come up in the past is when companies don't have a neutral age screen, they might have like the, the birthday pre-filled in to say that you were over 13 and up, um, which kind of gets you out of needing to comply with COPPA. Um, so it's not that the FTC is looking for like a specific method, because again, you can use any, any method you want that is reasonable in light of technology, though often companies will just do what is already like pre-approved given like the risk of not wanting to like innovate with a new method. Um, but the biggest challenge that has come up in the past is companies that just do not think that they need to comply with that requirement. Thanks, Billy. I just wanted to pick up on what you just said, because what, what we're trying to understand is that the FTC essentially approves certain methods that um, it then, if you utilize, you consider to be sufficient for the purposes of compliance, right? But uh, what's the experience been with how the FTC decides what is an approved method? And is there um, anything that we should be thinking about when we look at how our rules on, um, that is how the delegated legislation in India should consider this issue? Sure. So under COPPA, uh, there's the COPPA statute that the legislature passed, and then every uh, every so often, it's meant to be every five years, we're currently on a 10 year process, they're meant to update their rule, and they will often add new methods. Um, and so they will kind of like walk through an analysis and say, you know, like in 2013, they said mobile telephone was not a method that was um, that made sense, uh, reasonable in light of the technology for ensuring that it was likely to be apparent. Um, that they, they gave a lot of reasons for that, but really the gist was that just in 2013, our relationship with phones and kids and parents' relationships with phones was not the same as it was today. Um, and so they also allow for you to submit your own um, VPC mechanism. So you can submit it, uh, then they have 180 days to like read and review. They will open that up to public comment. Um, unfortunately, this has only happened uh, six times in the last 10 years. Because again, uh, I think companies are just often less incentivized to create new methods and would rather like work with what they have. Um, so the most recent one was actually last year, a company submitted a facial age estimation. So the technology does like um, a facial scan and tells you if you're under 25 or over 25. So that's the threshold they're looking for to figure out if that is apparent. Um, 
And so the FTC uh, can uh, approve or deny that method. We're still waiting on what they say. But then anytime that someone submits a method for approval, there is an opportunity for the public to comment and raise any of the concerns about uh, verifiability or whether the, uh, it is in compliance with COPPA. Thanks. Uh, just before uh, I come to my last question, Mr. Maheshwari, anything you want to add at this stage about what would you like to see actually now in rules based on everything that you've heard, you know, when we so, move from so, the act to the rules on implementation? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just like to mention that while the requirements have been set and the purpose has also been given in the act, as Brinda mentioned, that there are certain exceptions which have been also carved out for certain purposes or when the platform is supposed to be verifiably safe, that the age can be lowered and hopefully something of this sort comes out in the rules so as to alleviate the practical problems that each one of us have conveyed and are probably experiencing in our jurisdiction. Second, I do believe that if the difficulties continue to persist, I mean, I initially mentioned that it throws up lots of opportunities as well. The If the problems continue to persist, the law does provide different dates of implementation for different sections. The law also provides that if there are implementation challenges, then maybe certain sections can be reviewed. The law also provides maybe exemption of one or more of the sections. So, so, so per se, the law remains, but definitely the intent of the law is clear. And to that an extent, any workable solution, which I mean, because of the various techniques and depending upon the nature of the platform, <clears throat> maybe few techniques should work that the law remains flexible in its approach. And hopefully, hopefully, I mean, I, I, I I do agree with Mr. Donovan's uh, concerns that definitely the revenue, the cost of authentic work come out. I mean, we have taken lead in so many other areas. Hopefully, this should also be happening. But beyond this, flexibilities do remain, and hopefully that should also be exercised by the government to not to not to have the real, I mean, the practical problems to the to the platforms and to citizens as well. So uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Maheshwari. I think for just pointing out very valuable point that there is considerable scope in the act for us to make sure that you know, even if it looks like it's applicable on everyone, you can still figure out ways in which we can make the re requirement narrower in practice. And with that, just to conclude, we've got a couple of minutes left in this panel. Uh, Kirian, Iksan, uh, Rinda, uh, speaking from your relative standpoints, I think the last question that we really want to figure out is that at this stage, um, Iksan, perhaps from the Indonesian perspective, but Kirian and Rinda more from what, what's happening in India today, what is the kind of guidance and or regulatory support that we need um, uh, or, or that businesses require today to you know, start thinking about this in practice, uh, and perhaps not just in terms of the rules, but also in terms of what's required outside of that to make this practically work. Um, and Kiran, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, uh, then perhaps Iksan, uh, speaking from the Indonesian perspective, and then finally we can wrap up things with uh, Rinda on this final question. Yeah, absolutely. So I can tell you what we have seen um, that's been quite successful in in helping. Um, platforms and services navigate these sorts of requirements. Um, the example I like to give is you have a park and you have a fence around the park and you have a gate at the park. And in the park, you have a pool and you have a climbing frame and you have all these things that kids really, really want to play with. Um, but in order to get into the park, a kid needs to go through the gate. And a lot of these regulatory requirements are effectively putting a security guard on the gate. Uh, but kids will still get in because kids will climb over the fence. And so ultimately what you need guidance on meaningful guidance on um, particularly to avail yourself of some of the exceptions or um, have confidence that the security guard on the gate is, is appropriate is to know when to put a lifeguard on the pool, right? When to put a fence around the climbing frame. That's what's really meaningful to a, to a platform because ultimately 
what you're going to then do is incentivize a child to be honest when they're coming into that platform. Because if, if they know that there is so much friction at that onboarding point and the second they, they're honest about how old they are, it's all downhill from there, right? There's mm -hmm. tons of friction. Mom or dad's going to, you know, it's, it's just going to be a, a terrible experience. And they're not going to have access to anything anyway. But if you work backwards from what is it within those services that they, that's genuinely of concern to, to kids, you know, it might be loot boxes or chat or it could be payments or it could be advertising. What is it that's in there? Work back from that guidance because if you get that right, then we're going to see a real paradigm shift and kids coming into online services are going to say, great, I can be honest about my age. My parent can, can get involved. I'll have transparency. And we know that that, that kid exists. So you can have that relationship and I'm going to have a better experience. Um, and I think ultimately that's where the guidance can be particularly meaningful, you know, drawing that nexus between what's an appropriate security guard on the gate and how do you put that lifeguard on the pool? Thanks, uh, Kirian. I think that was a really very useful analogy, in fact, uh, that perhaps uh, many of us are going to uh, shamelessly now repurpose in our conversations on this topic. Uh, all credits to Kirian. Uh, Iksan, love to hear from you uh, on what, what businesses are looking for, perhaps in terms of just legal counsel on the topic as well. And then finally, Rinda, I would love to hear from you at the end. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Uh, a brief one uh, from my end uh, is... Uh perhaps waiting for the delegated regulations or implement, implementing regulations issued by the relevant authority might take some time. Uh, so perhaps uh, adopting uh, you know, a, a widely acceptable guidelines uh, that has been issued uh, by you know, um, uh, authorities uh, internationally, for example. Uh, my, I, I mentioned in, in, in the beginning of my um, uh, remark. Uh, it was uh, there was guidelines issued by the uh, International Telecommunication Union on uh, child uh, online protection. Uh, so they've issued several guidelines applicable not only for industry players but also for policymakers as well as uh, parents. Uh, so perhaps those are um, uh, you know instant quick fixes uh, that can be uh, implemented uh, in India. Uh, same same as what uh, Indonesia has, has done in. Um, uh, not long ago. Thank you. Uh, should I go ahead? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think just to, I mean, end with one thing, if things already been said. So I think just one point, which is that in India, we really do have the chance for some kind of making sure that we have codes of practice, which also build into light some of these guidances and these problems that do exist, right? So if we adopt this approach that what is this most serious concern that we're trying to face, you know, like if we adopt this risk-based approach that um, Kirian gave as well, I think having a code of practice where people actually work together to understand some of the practical implementations, because the other thing I want to point out is we've all been talking about companies, but there's a host of other data fiduciaries that are affected, right? So universities, which deal with, say, prospective students, who may some of whom are 18, some of whom are obviously under 18, you know, how do we deal with them? So I think we have to understand that not all data fiduciaries, first of all, are companies. Uh, we are also looking at, you know, these sort of universities, research organizations, which are also collecting um, children's data in a different way. And so I think having a codes of practice will be really helpful. And then just quickly to answer the two questions that are on the chat um, chatbot, I think like in terms of consent managers, uh, Premnath, you know, it's a whole different topic, but there's a lot of clarity that's only going to come in once the law is there. Uh, right now, the consent manager is accountable to you as an individual. Um, so whether the companies will be required to have a consent manager mandatorily or whether, you know, you will be free to appoint a consent manager from, you know, one of the board certified consent managers is a bit um, sort of left up to debate. And then on the second question by um, Dr. Preeti, which is that how will we, you know, India being a big country, language is always going to be an issue. The law currently only requires that the privacy notice either be in English or in any one of the languages. I think what I would like to see in terms of guidance is if the website is primarily focused towards, say, a Hindi-speaking audience, you know, if the text on the website is in Hindi, then I think it's advisable that the privacy notice is also in Hindi. Um, so I think if, if, you know, so it depends on what the website, whom the website or the app is focused towards, if it's in a regional language. Otherwise, unfortunately, this is one of the problems that, you know, a lot of the stuff is in English and it's not getting translated. No, so, that's it. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Vrinda. Thank you. Also, uh, I think also, even though the questions in the chat were relating to seemingly unconnected topics, they do actually relate back. So I think one of the 
great things that happened is that we saw in this panel about how intermediary platforms, consent managers could be valuable to solving this problem as well of, you know, ensuring that verifiable consent is operationalized. And that was something that we were pondering about in panel one, where we were trying to figure out what are the problems that consent managers can solve. And I think the other thing is that consent, even if it's collected from parents or from kids or from adults, ultimately has to meet the standards of consent underneath the act. So that includes, for example, the requirement for multiple languages. Um, and I think that's going to be one of the additional things that we have to think about when we're looking at the operationalization of this requirement. Consent is consent. So it's going to have to make sure that it still meets the standards of consent, regardless of who it's collected from. And uh, so with that, I'm going to call this panel to close. And uh, I'd like to invite Josh Lee from FPF to just come in and close out the webinar. And uh, thank you so much, everyone that stayed on. And thank you so much to our panelists for webinar two, um, who've been uh, uh, so gracious to provide us so many detailed comments on what's a complex topic. Over to you, Josh, to close us out. And uh, thank you so much. Thanks very much, Varun. And thank you to all the speakers. Uh, thanks for handing time to me. Uh, I'll make sure to keep this very short, uh, given that for all those on the APEC side of the house, I'm likely standing in the way of your dinner or the day's rest. And for others, I'm likely standing in the way of your most pro productive times of the day. But I want to make a quick remark on how much ground we've actually traversed today. We've looked at the content manager model and looking at the you know, questions about operationalization of how it might be implemented looking at the operational and business models and looking at the example from other sectors and other jurisdictions. On verifiable parental content, this panel, we've covered how we can strike a balance between protecting children and collecting parental content at scale, uh, the operational and regulatory challenges in that regard, the need for guidance, um, and the myriad of regulations in various regions of the world. Now, when we were planning this webinar, we were keeping in mind that we may have to react to the draft BPPA implementing rules being released. While that has yet to happen, and it's anyone's guess as to when they will finally drop, what I think we can all agree on is that our panelists have given us so much color and so much flesh on specific areas of the DPPA. You probably also agree with me that um, it would have been even more beneficial if we had more of these webinars to discuss other equally important aspects of the act. But as they all say, all good things must come to an end. And this marks the end of a series of two webinars that FPF and NASCOM have brought together over the last two months, covering different aspects of content in the DPDPA. As with the previous webinar, the recording of this one will be made available on NASCOM's YouTube page after this session. So this will allow you to relieve all the wonderful insights that have been shared over the last four hours we've spent together. And speaking of reliving, this will certainly not be the last that you hear from the Future of Privacy Forum in India. We are very much excited to expand our coverage and our understanding of the Indian data protection landscape for our global audience, and you'll definitely hear more from us in the near future. So the only last thing for me to say is a word of simple but heartfelt thanks. Thanks to Varun, Ashish, Priyanka, and NASCOM and, and the team for this wonderful collaboration in making these two wonderful webinars come to life. It's been an unforgettable and meaningful collaboration together, and I can't wait to see how more we can collaborate in the future. Thanks to our excellent panelists and experts for today's session and the last session. Um, you, guys, you guys have brought so many deep insights to our audience, and thank you for tipping in with your voice such an important milestone in India's data protection journey. Thanks to my FPF colleagues as well, um, Gabriela, Bianca, Alex, Christina, Megan, Bailey, and more, for working hard in front and behind the scenes to put everything together. And last but certainly not least, to all of you, the audience, without whom these sessions would not have been possible nor meaningful. I'll close out here and hand the time back to Varun. See you all again too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And NASCOM's not going anywhere. Look to us for all things in like data protection in India. And yeah, thank you so much. Good night, everyone.